For today's main topic, we're going to be covering an article by The Hill. This article is called, Parents Pay At Least One Monthly Bill for 40% of Millennials. Now, this article was written in February, and I saw it, and I, I earmarked it as something that I really wanted to share on the podcast. I think it's very important for us to recognize what the ideal financial boundaries are for us to have in our parent-child relationships. I also think this article can provide a great deal of healthy context for us to have that conversation. So let's begin. The article starts by saying, In a new survey, two-fifths of millennials say their parents still pick up one or more of their monthly bills. And the most common parental subsidy is the largest, housing. 24% of millennials say mom and dad pay their rent. And 17% say parents cover a mortgage. So here you have around 40% of millennials who are having their parents pay for their housing costs. That is not only the largest chunk of what their monthly budget should be, but it's one that I'm sure is causing undue stress to the parents. Smaller shares of the 26 to 41% demographic reported parental help with groceries, 22%, utility bills, 19%, auto insurance, 18%, car payments, 16%, or streaming services, 12%. It's just really expensive to be a young person now, said Kimberly, a personal finance expert at NerdWallet. The cost of housing, of food, across the board, everything is expensive, especially in big cities. It can be a huge asset to be able to turn to your parents. The findings come from a survey of 2,000 Americans conducted by market researcher One Poll for Chartway Federal Credit Union in Virginia. For young adults, the 2020s have posed one economic challenge after another, spiraling inflation, rising rents, lagging wages, soaring home prices. Amid those challenges, young Americans have blurred the lines between childhood and adulthood. Young adults are staying in school longer and graduating with ever larger loads of student loan debt. They're postponing marriage and a first home purchase as they labor to dig themselves out. I need to praise the article for mentioning that student loan debt is basically putting millennials and those who are graduating now from school behind the eight ball. Rising student loan debt, rising average student loan debt, is indeed something that is making it more challenging to afford an ever more expensive society. Now, just because things are expensive does not mean that parents need to pay for their adult children's stuff. I think this particular economical climate that's described in the article makes it all the more important for millennials, for adult children that are mentioned here, to be running a budget and being frugal with their money. The problem here with adult children not being financially independent isn't necessarily that everything is so expensive, but they're not exercising the financial discipline in order to manage themselves independently in that sort of climate. It is possible. I've seen it done. That is indeed the ideal, and it's something that we'll find out later in the article that everybody is striving for anyway. The article continues here. In 2022, 19% of men and 12% of women in the 25 to 34 age group cohabitated with their parents. The COVID-19 pandemic drove adult children from cramped apartments and crowded downtowns into the more spacious confines of their childhood homes. There is a new timeline for the transition to adulthood, said Christine, a sociologist at Northwestern University, and that's partly because of the increased timeline for schooling, that people need to get a good job. And parents see this, and they are trying to support their children as they are getting more education and getting their lives together. I want to mention here, this is a place where I believe my parents did a great job in raising me to know what my limits were with education, what, where my limits were with what they would do to support me, and what the expectation was for me moving out and becoming independent. My parents had a rule that I could continue living with them as long as I was actively going to college. They gave a limit on it and said that if as long as I was going to college and I was getting good grades, I could stay there. And... Everything else was going to be on me. I had to pay my car insurance, my gas. I had to buy my own car. Meals, they would feed me if I was at home. But everything else was on me. College, books, tuition, that was that was for me to cover. So what they basically did is they said, we will cover room and board for you, and you can stay with us because we support 
you're going to school so that you can have a higher paying job. You don't necessarily have to go to school to have a good high paying job, especially if it's a career that you don't want. However, if it's something that you want to incentivize as a parent, you need to simply put an expectation and a limit on it. I did end up staying in school for six years. I got a concurrent five-year bachelor's degree alongside a master's in architectural engineering and a minor in physics. I don't know if my parents had expected me to stay a whole six years, and as a parent who will eventually be in the same situation someday, I might put a cap on the number of years. That way, I don't end up having an adult child at home for 10 years while they go through law school or medical school. Let's continue with the article. The new survey joins a growing data file on the evolving financial relationship between adult children and their parents. A December survey by Credit Karma, the personal finance company, found that 31% of parents support adult children financially, either by allowing them to live in the parental home or by paying some of or all of their bills. A significant share of parents said that they still pay their adult children a monthly allowance. Okay, paying a monthly allowance to an adult child or covering their bills is effectively doing two things, in my opinion. One, it's separating the association of work and money, basically giving a sense of entitlement to the child. And this is going to be true when you're raising a child or if you're continuing to give an adult child an allowance. You're basically building an association and a dependency. The healthiest family relationships that I know, especially those with adult children, are those that are based on the individuals involved in the relationship being completely independent, self-sufficient adults. If you have a dependency between two family members who should be de- independent adults, you end up putting a poison in the relationship that changes it in a way and not for the better. An unhealthy dependency can break down relationships in a way that's ugly. And I don't want that for you. So if you're in a situation like this, this is a situation where dependency is being perpetuated and it's one that should be broken for the sake of the parent's pocketbook and the overall maturity for all individuals involved as we grow to become more independent. Independence allows the relationship, the family relationship or the friendship to flourish in a way where the relationship is fully and wholly a decision. It's one that you get to choose. Just like having a nest egg that's healthy enables you to go to work because you choose to, because you want to, not because you have to. If you have a dependency in the relationship, the relationship continues because it has to, not because it's a free choice. And I ask you a question now. If love is not a free choice, is it love? Is it a loving relationship? The article continues. Another survey by consumer website savings.com found that fully half of parents with adult children provide them at least some financial support. Of that group, the average parent reported spending $1,000 a month on adult children, covering everything from rent to food to tuition to travel. Most of today's young adults seem to accept parental support, not out of desperation, but simply because it is available and because they believe the parent can afford it. Just because it's available doesn't make it right. However, if you were to offer me free money, despite the relationship, I'd probably take the free money without even thinking about the consequences to the relationship. This is a place where money can build an unhealthy dependency, while the decision behind falling into that dependency seems like a no-brainer mathematically. I mean, it's free money. Let's continue. When the one poll survey asked millennials why parents cover some of their expenses, the largest group, 30%, chose the response, they haven't told me to pay them myself. Another 26% said it was because it was cheaper to stay on their parents' tab. A smaller group said because they are financially comfortable. Only 12% said they could not afford to pay the bills themselves. This dependency that's growing out here, unlike what the start of the article said, is not primarily because everything is so expensive that millennials or adult children are not able to pay for things themselves. They can most likely afford it, and even if they say that they cannot afford it and they need the help, well, engaging with a frugal budget, a written plan for their money, can put them in a position where they can figure out how to make ends meet. It's not a matter of if you can make ends meet, it's a matter of how. 
Let's keep going. Streaming services may not be fond of allowing adult children to share a subscription with their parents, but the broader notion of leaning on one's parents for financial support seems to have widespread acceptance in 2020 society. Because it's so common, it's nothing to be embarrassed about, and it's nothing that you should feel like you need to hide, Palmer said. Even so, most millennials seem to desire financial independence. A large majority told one poll they plan to cover all of their own bills within a year or two. For most parents, supporting an adult child is the very essence of parenting. I disagree, but anyway. But doing so can be costly. One nerd wallet analysis estimated that parents who choose to cover a child's expenses into adulthood sacrifice as much as $227,000 in lost retirement savings. Clearly, the potential cost of supporting a child into perpetuity has some parents spooked. Footing the bill for adult children, one AARP article asks, how to stop for your good and theirs. Now I agree with that. Breaking this dependency, which is mutually desired and mutually beneficial for both, is indeed for the good of both involved, parent and adult child alike. Let's move on. A Pew Research study found that a majority of American adults believe parents do too much for their adult children. Agreed. Pew also found that two-thirds of American adults think that children should be financially independent by 22. Yet, only one quarter of adults actually achieve independence by that age. In a recent Credit Karma survey, two-thirds of parents who support their children said the effort causes them financial stress. Many aging parents face debt and inflationary pressures of their own. Financial planners say parents should budget their own expenses before they offer to support an adult child. This is just like putting your oxygen mask on in an airplane before you help a child. You need to make sure that you can breathe, that you can function, so that you can successfully help them. If you help them and they they are a child who cannot function on their own, let alone help you put your mask on, well, you might end up passing out and they may not end up keeping their mask on at all. Same goes for the situation we're talking about here. Let's continue. The parents should be taking care of themselves first, said James, president of the Financial Planning Association, a trade group. What I would recommend is that parents make sure that they are taking care of their own finances and are saving for their own retirement so they won't run out of money in their own lifetime. If the numbers don't add up, experts say, it may be time for parent and child to have a difficult conversation. Even if the numbers don't add up, seeking independence for the adult child who has an unhealthy dependency on their parents is probably going to be best for everybody, but it's going to be especially important to have this conversation if the numbers aren't matching up for the parent and they are sacrificing their dignity in retirement for the sake of covering the streaming service for their adult child. Set an expiration date or a deadline for the adult child to take over the bills, said Courtney, consumer financial advocate at Credit Karma. Set the date and then be willing to engage with your child. The typical young adult wants to be financially independent and have a path forward. It's just been so hard, especially for this demographic. So yes, in the end, the adult children who are dependent on their parents want to have financial independence. They may not have the plan to get there, but they know that they want to be there in a year or two. Sort of kicking the can down the road. You ask them at any point, it's probably going to be a year or two for all of them, no matter how long they've been dependent on their parents. And for most parents, it's going to be financially advantageous for them to be able to break away from being a dependent provider for their adult child and allow them to become independent on their own. It's going to help them grow and mature with money. In the story that I shared today, in the way that I plan on raising my son, I want to put an emphasis on leading him to a place where he can be immediately financially independent when he graduates from school. Or if he decides to not go to school, I want him to be able to strike out on his own and be financially independent in very short order. I'll probably end up giving him a deadline, just like they recommend in the article, and say, at this point, you are on your own. I will help walk with you and help you develop a plan if you have questions, but you need to be able to work that plan on your own. 
That should be a key goal for parents who have young children now who aren't grown. And if you're in a situation where you are the adult child, you're dependent on the parent, and you want to break away from it, well, it is so vital for you to sit down and do a written plan, figure out what it is that you need to do in order to basically support yourself and be financially independent from your parents, then bring it up to them and tell them that you want to work on being more financially independent for your well-being and theirs, and here's the process that you see to go, and you can give the deadline. You don't have to wait for your parent to bring it up. The number one reason why adult children say they are still dependent on their parents, according to this article, was because the parent just simply hasn't cut them off yet. And if it's genuinely true that you as the adult child want to break away from that, well, you can make that choice and you can lead that communication. It may not ever feel like it comes down from your parents. They may not feel like it is a loving thing to do for you. However, because independence fosters a relationship where love and relationship is indeed a free choice, it helps the relationship flourish. It helps love flourish. It helps free the relationship up to be better than it possibly could be with a dependence. If you're one of the parents supporting an adult child, you need to know that it's not unloving to pull your support, your financial support away from them and encourage financial independence. You need to do it out of a place of love though. You need to say, this is what's going to be best for you. It's going to be what's best for me. In either situation, what you need to do to relieve this sort of problem is sit down and just be brutally honest, but also sincere and vulnerable. You need to say, I love you, and I think this is what's going to be best for both of us. This is why. These are the reasons. And I want to work with you on steps so that we can both be financially independent of each other. It's going to be the best thing for our relationship. It's going to be the best thing for our financial boundaries. It's going to be the best thing for our futures. And I want to leave you with the hope that there is a brighter future and a more beautiful relationship on the other side of having that hard conversation. I hope today's podcast was helpful for you and that you enjoyed listening. And if you did enjoy listening, I hope that you subscribe to the podcast and support us and continue listening to us in the future. Until next week on Tuesday. Budget bravely and enjoy your hope-filled financial future.